Monsoon Ragas by Catherine Butler Schofield. Listen. This is the song of the storm cloud and the rain on the earth, Rag Gorn Malhar. Did you hear the wind as it slowly scooped the water out of the hot summer sea, carrying it high above the coastline, stacking it with those long leisurely Niba Marireba vocal glides into rolling, roiling layers darker and darker until storm cloud blots out the harsh white daylight and turns everything green and muddy yellow and black like a bruise and the wind swirls and churns and the trees bend low and the electricity in the air winds tighter and tighter and we wait as coiled springs for the first sharp crack and the sky's responsive roar and the rain pelting hard warm rain did you hear that in the song of Shubraguha. Did you feel that, those of you who have known the monsoon, you who long for its arrival at this time of the year, you who miss real rain in a country where rain is never hard and always cold? Ah, but I have led you a little astray. For this storm cloud here in this picture is not, in fact, hovering somewhere off the southwest coast of India. It is rolling in off the Pacific Ocean, over the port of Brisbane, where I grew up. We don't get the monsoon in Brisbane. What we get instead is a mild, dry winter and a hot, humid summer punctuated by tremendous afternoon thunderstorms. As my father lately reminded me, I was born during the Great Brisbane Flood of 1974, and now you all know exactly how old I am. I think some of that storm water must have got into my veins because the best memories of my childhood are of sweating desperately under a ceiling fan in 39 degree heat, feeling the humidity intensify and with it the thrill of anticipation, knowing a cooling thunderstorm was coming, of the excitement of the rising wind and the clouds and the lightning, of the bliss of running outside to be drenched to the skin, or of tucking up in bed with a book while hail pounds on a corrugated iron roof, of the heavenly smell after the rain of petrichor, sondimahag, the scent of rain on hot earth. I suspect my Brisbane childhood is why I feel such a strong affinity for the Indian monsoon, 
for the intense emotions it produces and for the arts it has inspired, most particularly the melodic modes of the monsoon ragas. My recent edited volume, Monsoon Feelings, with Imke Rajamani and Margaret Perno, takes this as its subject. In this half hour or so, I want to take you on a journey inwards with the monsoon, from the stratosphere to the human heart, through courts, temples and shrines, gardens, art and song, and at the heart of it all, a monsoon raga, an Indian melodic mode that we can't hear anymore, because it is lost. But maybe we can still feel it. Seen from an atmospheric distance, the South Asian monsoon is one of the world's great weather systems. Caused by a temperature difference at the hottest point of the summer between the land and the Indian Ocean, the monsoon is a fast, moist wind that, when it hits land, rises with the heat radiating from the dry earth to a point in the atmosphere where it cools and releases its moisture, drenching the earth with rain. The monsoon arrives on the Malabar coast at the southern tip of India around about the 1st of June and makes its way northward until the whole of India is cloud covered by mid to late July and then retreats in September. Seen from slightly closer in from the Indian Ocean, the monsoon is of matchless historical importance. The word monsoon comes from a Portuguese corruption of the Arabic word morsum or season. And it was when Arab sailors cracked the code of the monsoon winds a thousand years ago that faster, safer, long-distance trade connecting the Mediterranean and the South China Sea across the Indian Ocean became regular and frequent, with India as the central stopping-off point. Long before European ships curved around the Cape, East Africans, Arabs, Ottomans, Jews, Armenians, Gujaratis, Tamils, Achanese, Malays and Chinese, among many others, traversed this space on the monsoon winds. So reliable was this airy vehicle that the great 15th century Arab navigator Ibn Majid saw the monsoon above all as a specific date for sailing from a port, according to Sunil Amrit. With trade came religious pilgrimage and mission diplomats and conquerors, new foodstuffs and fine goods and dress and manners of wearing it and languages and literatures. And it was the monsoon too that brought a new group of traders to India from small, cold maritime provinces far to the northwest with ludicrous imperial ambitions. It is said that it was Ibn Majid himself who guided Vasco da Gama into Calicut port in 1498, though others have said it was a Gujarati mariner. Either way, the navigator was local to the Indian Ocean. If we narrow our lens further to the Indian subcontinent, the monsoon is of vital significance as rain, intense, heavy, warm downpours that cool and replenish the overheated earth and make it fertile. Indian agriculture and fresh water supplies are largely dependent upon the rainy season, and the monsoon itself has determined over centuries what kinds of crops are cultivated and where what kind of food eaten and how. If the monsoon arrives as anticipated, there will be a bountiful harvest and money in people's pockets. If it is strong, there will be flooding, damage and loss of life. But if it is weak and scanty, there will be famine, rioting and death. The rainy season has also long been a culturally sanctioned time of recuperation from worldly duties. In the past, the monsoon was a season of respite for North India's armies. Heavy rain made baggage trains sink to their axles in mud, swollen rivers swept soldiers away to watery graves, and war horses and elephants struggled over roads rendered impassable by mudslides, fallen trees and flood water. So the onset of the rains generally heralded a temporary cessation of military hostilities and a spell in which warriors nestled down and enjoyed the more pleasurable activities of courtly life. Feasting, music and dancing, and making love and begetting heirs. The monsoon is thus not merely a weather phenomenon. It is fundamental to human matters of birth and love and death, and thus to the emotional contours of Indian life. There are deep instinctive links between the anticipation of the rains and their arrival and their emotional resonances of longing for love and love's fulfilment. 
Certain natural heralds of the rainy season, particularly migrating and breathing birds, have become particularly intense signifiers in poetry, art and music of these cyclical emotions of longing, fulfilment and romance, viraha and shringara. The pied-crested cuckoo, the chartak bird, who in legend only drinks rainwater, flies into India from Africa ahead of the monsoon in order to breed while the bright pink flamingo flies westward against the green-black clouds to its breeding grounds in the Middle East, and the peacock spreads his luxuriant tail to begin his dance of courtship. We see a peacock here in this detail from a painting of Krishna and Radha sheltering in the rain, now in the Walters Art Museum. Here is a selection from Monsoon Feelings, from the 16th century Avadi poet Jayasi's great romance Padmavat, as translated by Francesca Orsini. It forms part of a set piece called a Baramasa, in which all 12 months of the year, in this case divided into six seasons, are described in terms of the feelings of the heroine for her beloved. This is from the section on the months of the rain. When it rains in the monsoon and you have your beloved, the monsoon months, Savan and Padal, delight even more. The cuckoo sings, herons fly in a line, girls walk about like red lac beetles, lightning flashes, golden rain falls on the earth, frogs and peacocks coo in such lovely voices. 250 years later, monsoon bird life still populated the Prajpasha court songs set in our long lost monsoon raga, Rag Gond, that were written by the blind Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II, who reigned from 1759 to 1806, here in David Lund's translation. Seeing the green earth, the peafowl makes a noise. In every direction over every house, the lowering clouds swirl and the thunder roars. As many monsoon song compositions do, this lyric uses onomatopoeia to drum home the rumming of the rain of the earth and the rooftops in the second line. Gar gar kata kum rahi kankur. But the emotional contours of the monsoon are complex and ambiguous, not always joyous and brimming with romantic fulfilment. The monsoon winds might be regular to the point of predictability, but the rains are capricious and unpredictable. They may be late or come in a feeble state with all the emotional uncertainty that implies. The monsoon may herald the return of the earth to the rule of Soma, the moon, which, according to Ayurveda, releases and replenishes all rasas, meaning juice or essence, the sap or juice that is the life force of everything, but also a set of potent emotional essences that are tasted in the arts and musical performance. On the other hand, during the four months of the rainy season, Lord Vishnu sleeps, and with the gods absent, demons can play. Lovers may rejoice in the bliss of their union as the rain thunders down on the roof. But for the Varahani, the sorrowful heroine whose beloved is absent, the pain of her longing becomes almost unbearably intense. Let us move further in again, then, towards the emotional heart occupied by the monsoon ragas by way of the architectural and social contexts in which they were sung. In the early modern period of the devotional saint poets of Bhakti and the Mughal and Hindu rulers, monsoon imagery saturated both courtly and devotional song texts. Indeed, many songs could be turned to either context. The imperial Mughal court, the Jat court of Bharatpur, the Sufi shrine, the ashram in Vrindavan. But in the 17th and 18th centuries, rulers began building palaces and gardens designed specifically for the enjoyment of the monsoon. Here is a Vaishnavite devotional song in the language of Braj, the homeland of Lord Krishna, written in Vrindavan, where Krishna spent his youth, by the Radha Vallabhi saint poet Vrindavandas, who died around 1787. But it could as easily describe this mid-18th century courtly painting from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston of a prince of Udaipur enjoying the arrival of the monsoon from a breezy pavilion at the very top of his palace. It is to be sung in the major monsoon rag Rag Malhar, and the translation is by Richard David Williams. The clouds gather and lightning flashes. 
the cuckoo and the peacock cry out, standing in a white mansion, delighted, the princely pair are watching. Their garments are beautiful on their two bodies, their ornaments are red and rare. Even the clouds and lightning are ashamed when they see the beauty of this couple. The forest trees and creepers become verdant, the earth turns green with affection. The Yamuna River flows so very deeply, the clouds rain down with a pitter-patter. Against the Arlap of Rauk Malhar, light and dark drape their arms over each other's shoulders as though a flock of wild geese were singing over the glorious lakes of Rindavan. Perhaps the most iconic garden complex made for the enjoyment of the monsoon is the series of gardens and pavilions at Deeg, built by successive Jat rulers of Bharatpur between the 1720s and 1760s. They had gained their independence from the Mughals and were busy setting themselves up as a political force to be reckoned with. Bharatpur is in the Braj region, and the rulers were devotees of Lord Krishna. The garden is full of large water tanks and fountains designed to replicate the monsoon all year round, with several airy pavilions in stone, modelled on imperial Mughal examples. Most innovative, though, is the Keshav Bhavan, which is open on four sides to catch any breezes. This is Kathy Asher's description of it from Monsoon Feelings. Between two sets of pillars is a continuous water channel with 16 water fountains. Sitting on the platform, one could experience the splashing spray of the fountains, look to the west and see the swing reminiscent of the monsoon, or to the east at the waters of the Rupsagar. The pavilion has a double roof, and copper pipes allowed water to spray through holes in the ceiling, emulating rain and so bringing the joys of the monsoon even in other seasons. Rolling copper balls in the ceiling, agitated by the movement of water, created the sound of thunder, thus further emulating the sounds of the much-anticipated monsoon. Joshi notes that when the water-emulating rain is released on a sunny day against the spouting fountains, they complete the fantasy by creating a rainbow. Another monsoon feature at Deeg is a large stone arch taken as booty from Shah Jahan's palace in Agra and installed by the Bharatpur rulers for use as a monsoon swing, or jula. In Monsoon Feelings, classical singer Vidya Rao notes that the jula is also the name of a song genre, which she says is drawn from women's folk music which has been absorbed into the repertoire of classical tunri. Generally, jula is sung during the rains, especially at the start of the monsoon. It is a time in every village and small town in India when young girls abandon their chores and exult in swinging through the air on jewellers tied to the branches of trees. My teacher, Nena Deviji, tells me, the arch that the jeweller, the swing, traces as it flies through the air, that arc is the reflection of the rainbow on the earth. In that moment I release something important, the swing, its movement through the air, and the movement across the vast spectrum of sound in the jeweller that I am singing signal for me the meeting of earth and sky, the coming together of all things eternally held apart, opposed. I feel a tremendous sense of peace, of release, from the incessant chatter of my busy life. Suddenly, singing the monsoon in Tumri seems to me to mediate the coming together and resolution of all those contradictions I carry in my heart. The notes, swaying from one to the other, now smoothly in a gentle flowing neend, now in a saucy kutka, now in a swirling murki. These are the yearning of earth and sky to meet in a world which eternally keeps self and other apart. And so, singing the sweet, charming lyrics that describe Sita seated on a swing, sailing through the air on the banks of Saru River, her silken garments and long snake-like plait rippling behind her, I feel that sense of yearning for something I can barely articulate, a yearning for a space that negotiates contradictions, a space where I can rest in just being. And she quotes another Tumri composition, this time concerning the love of the human woman Radha for her divine beloved Krishna, after whom the Keshav Bhavan Monsoon Pavilion at Deeg is named. Rock the swing gently, Krishna, O dark one, a silken rope, 
a carved wooden swing. Sweet Rata swings on this lovely swing. Rock the swing gently, Banuari. The devotional connection of Rata and Krishna with the monsoon is explored more fully in the many monsoon songs of the Rata Vallabhi community based in Vrindavan, especially those written by 18th century saint poet Vrindavan Das. The Rata Vallabhis explicitly explore the experience of engaging with divine love through rasa, as expressed through communal song. The rasas explored devotionally in Rata Vallabhi songs are essential emotional essences that make the listener wet with affective potential, writes Richard David Williams. Monsoon imagery, and especially the imagery of Radha and Krishna huddled close together under an umbrella or entwined greenery while the thunder and rain erupt all around them, draws out the literal fluidity of rasa flowing through the devotional song, leading to the saturation and immersion of the devotees in the emotional experience of the two lovers. Here is another monsoon song by Vrindavandas translated by Richard Williams, and this painting is from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. They are playing in the grove now, my friend. Come beside me and watch. The grove has settled in the sky. The wind has borne love aloft. The fair and the dark tumble down and embrace. Oh, these clothed clouds are raining down Rasa. Overwhelming delight crashes down like driving rain. Her ornaments thunder wildly. Strands of her hair spread out elegantly like clouds, raining loosened flowers like giant raindrops. Against his dark limbs, her pale body is electric like hidden glaring lightning. How fine are her hands, tender as new shoots, sprouting higher with the desire of body and heart. Her breathing heaves into a drawn-out sigh as he gathers her into his strong arms in the wet round dance. The lotus of her smiling face bursts into bloom as though her arching eyebrows were fighting. The rivers and streams of her different desires fill up. Every moment her yearning surges forth. Her eyes become startled like a deer gazing longingly at her hunter through the locks of her hair. The beauty charges, roaming through the forest. Restlessness overtakes her trembling limbs. Her gestures are flirtatious as though charged to bound away, throwing out side glances in vain. My thoughts are drenched with their playful coupling as though it were the rainy season, body with body, heart with heart entangled, spirit soaring with spirit, oh. Vrindavan's loving beauty in the extreme, rasa in the extreme, such is this bounty of bliss. This sense of coziness and romantic joy locked in the embrace of the beloved in a time and space set apart temporarily for enjoyment also lies at the heart of the Mughal Palace complex at Mehrori, south of Delhi, which grew up beside the tomb shrine of the Chishti Sufi saint Kutubuddin Bakhtiar Kaki, largely in the 18th century. The palace at Mehrori was built as the Mughal monsoon palace, with pleasure gardens, pools and pavilions designed explicitly to enjoy the rainy season. This is a painting in the British Library, of members of the royal household playing in the Jarna or waterfall at Mehroli, a peaceful scene enhanced in its serenity by Mehroli's restful resident Sufi Saint Kutubuddin, who contributes his personal temperament of quiet fulfilment to the atmosphere of this secluded time and place. And it was in this space, and this time, that the songs Shah Alam wrote in the lost monsoon Raga Ragond would have been sung probably by the professional singers that were always in the emperor's household entourage, but perhaps by the emperor himself. Several of his songs refer to his experience of the monsoon pleasure gardens at Mehroli. This one refers to the annual day on which the court moved from Shah Jahanabad, now Old Delhi, to Mehroli. Come on this beautiful, splendid day, today, Wednesday, take the air and delight in the garden, Emperor Shah Alam, sate your thirst and take pleasure in the matters of Ragond. And this one encapsulates the mood of this secluded spot perfectly. The great beauty of the green earth pleases and the clouds circle all around. This pauper makes his pilgrimage to beg a boon of Lord Kutubuddin. 
The peafowl murmur atop the hills while the frogs make noise as they gather. Turn your eyes to the beautiful waterfalls and spread the covering over his tomb fully. And so we arrive, finally, at the heart of the matter. And the monsoon ragas themselves, more specifically, Ragond. But there is a mystery here, too as although Ragond was quite clearly extremely important in the late 18th century, in the intervening years, it has been lost. We don't know what it sounded like. Firstly, for those of you who don't know, I should describe what a raga is melodically. This is an example of what a raga is in pictorial terms from the Manly Ragmala in the British Museum. But melodically, it's quite different to the Western concept of a scale. So a scale might be Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, Ti, La, So, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. I'm going to use Gorn's relative, Gorn Malha, to demonstrate. And this is a note for aficionados of the Raga. Gorn was definitely a different Rag from Gorn Malha, which we heard at the beginning at this point in the 18th century. So a raga has two avatars. Sonically, it is a melodic formula or skeleton that provides a blueprint for composition. Each rag is made up of a set of sound marks that identify it uniquely as that rag. Gorng Malhar makes use of sound marks common to monsoon or Malhar ragas, the use of raised knee in ascent and lowered knee in descent. Nisa. Sunny, Nisa, Sunny, and Mare, Repa, Nipa. But it adds a little extra to them to create its own specific flavour. Gamare, Pa, Dani, Pa. So we end up with a basic shape for Gond Malhar, something like this. But a raga is much more than just its sound, of course. It also takes a visual or imagined form as a hero, heroine or deity that embodies a specific emotional mood with a supernatural force awakened by the musician's expert handling of those sound marks. Like the oldest of them all, Rag Meg, monsoon ragas all embody slightly different moods of longing and fulfilment brought on by the monsoon. And they also, in theory, possess the supernatural power to bring on the drought-quenching rains. Unfortunately, Ragond has been obsolete in North Indian classical music since the turn of the 20th century. I am not a necromancer, and I can't bring the sound of Ragond back from the dead. But what we can identify through Mughal musical notations, painting and poetry is Gorn's specific emotional flavour and the effect it had on Mughal listeners, and one listener and song composer in particular, the Emperor Shah Alam. By the late 18th century, the Mughal Empire was reduced to the outskirts of Delhi after a series of invasions, wars and the encroachment of rival powers. The life and reign of Shah Alam II was full of pathos and tragedy, as well as resilience and dignity in the face of his diminishment. In 1788, Shah Alam's power had dissipated to such an extent that he had his eyes gouged out in his own throne room by the Afghan warlord Ghulam Qadir. Thereafter, while he was largely left in quietude for the remainder of his long life, he lived it as a puppet of the Marathas, and finally, after 1803, of the East India Company. Shah Alam was renowned as a fine poet and composer of songs in the Burj Pasha, Urdu and Persian languages. His best songs were compiled into a large collection in 1797 called the Nadarati Shahi, the Emperor's Choicest Compositions. David Lan and I first became inspired to find out more about Ragond because, although it's been lost since, it was clearly Shah Alam's favourite rag 
and the most important monsoon rag of the late Mughal period. What then were Ragorn's specific emotional qualities and why did it appeal so much to Shah Alam? We can use clues from its 18th century melodic structure, Shah Alam's own poetry in Ragorn and Ragmala paintings of the time to get a feeling for it. As Shah Alam sang, translated by David Lunn, Now lover, if you should so desire, listen to the melody of Gorned. Give voice to the plaintive cries of your heart. Tell dear your emotions in company. The most obvious hints that Gorned was a monsoon rug lie in the poetry. We can also tell from its sonic structure in music treatises of the time, though I won't bore you with the details. Suffice it to say, Gorned was a major monsoon rug suspiciously close to today's Mian Kemalhar. Shah Alam's poetry nuances her understanding of Gorned as a monsoon raga associated with the earth. Shah Alam's songs drench us with rainwater, low dark clouds, thunder and lightning and earthy greenery, and draw out the exquisite monsoon tension of love stretched between longing for and fulfilment of union, of the lover's return at this time of tucking up together in a secluded place. We have already heard a couple of them. Here are two more. The rains and the waters, the thunder roars, and the clouds gather. Now our eyes are longing to drink. The lightning flashes and shakes my very life. My darling, how will you get your satisfied rest? And here is a very clever one. What does it feel like when the rains have come, but your lover still has not returned? The promises of the coil, Papiha and Pifal, have distressed me. Without the eyes of my beloved, the rainy season might as well last six months. The emotional valencies of Ragond are reinforced by paintings of this rag in the Ragamala or Garland of Raga tradition. An 18th century copy of the painting I showed before from the manly Ragmala describes Gond thus in Richard Williams' translation. Gond is an impassioned, exquisite woman. She holds the thought of her distant lover tenderly in her heart. Sitting with the one source of her love before her, she reads aloud the words inscribed upon her heart. Her friends beside her play to her. With sweet notes they sing of the thrills of happiness. When she hears word of her lover's approach, her body blooms and her bliss thunders. She decks herself in a special colourful dress and watches the roads in every direction. Gorned as an impassioned woman, beautiful in her desire, completely devoted to her lord, her soul knows of the approach of her lover. The flower of her body burns. Emotionally, then, Ra Gorn seems to have represented the imminent moment of joyful union between the clouds and the earth, the lover and the beloved, the moment of the most intense anticipation when the lover knows that the promise of her beloved's return is definitely going to be fulfilled, but he is not quite yet come. What then was the particular emotional valency of Ragorn to Shah Alam, and why did he set so many of his songs in this rag? Those of Shah Alam's songs that concern Mehrali do indeed have a specific local cast to their emotional flavour. I beg this of you, Lord Qutbuddin, fulfil all the desires of my life. I worship you. Please hear me, constantly touching your feet. Give riches and a country to Shah Alam, and fill his treasure house. Strolling beneath the mango trees, gazing at the spread cloth and the waterfalls. From our perspective, the poignancy of these songs is almost painful. For this Mughal emperor's dearest hopes and desires for his life and his country would remain forever in the realm of longing. The hope expressed here is deeply sad in retrospect. In 1806, a few months before the emperor died and was laid to rest forever at Mahuli. Deputy Re British resident William Fraser wrote home to his father in Invernessia. At this time, I was constantly at the side of the king and could not but admire his extreme nobility. The loss of his eyes does not at all disfigure his countenance, but the history of their loss and of his misfortunes exalts to the highest our pity and our veneration. On his death, and not until then, we may say that the line of Timur is extinct as a dynasty, beginning with the lame and ending with the blind.
it took a little longer than that. Until in 1858, the British sent his grandson, Bahadur Shah Zafar, into incarcerated exile for the term of his natural life. The promises of the monsoon burns at Mehrali remained empty. Shah Alam's hopes for the restoration of his kingdom were never fulfilled, and the last Mughal emperor lies still in Yangon in Burma, buried in a foreign grave. In the words of this Tumri song, translated by Vidya Rao, the roof thatch has become old, my love, and the clouds have started raining down. Come home, my love, come home from that foreign land. My sindoor grows mouldy in its box, my love, and the clouds have started raining down. Come home, my love, come home from that foreign land.